Hello, you are listening to the podcast of the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm your host, Rafael Kachturian. Joining us today is Joe Sauce. Professor Sauce is the CALS Chair for the Study of Public Service at the University of Minnesota, where he holds faculty positions in the Hubert H. Humphrey School of Public Affairs, the Department of Political Science, and the Department of Sociology. Professor Sauce is the author of Unwanted Claims, The Politics of Participation in the U.S. Welfare System, and together with Richard Fording and Sanford Schramm, he's the co-author of the award-winning Disciplining the Poor, Neoliberal Paternalism and the Persistent Power of Race. In addition to these, he's also the co-editor of two other books, Remaking America, Democracy and Public Policy in an Age of Inequality, and Race and the Politics of Welfare Reform. His current research project explores the relationship between practices of mass incarceration, the politics of race, and the political economy of neoliberalism. And this will be the topic of our conversation today. Professor Sauce, thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. So people are increasingly becoming aware of the biased nature of the American criminal justice system. But people are probably less aware of how criminal justice practices strip resources from poor communities in ways that contribute to social inequalities and perpetuate them. Can you talk us through uh, about how some of this works? Sure. Um, the, the major changes here have really happened since the early 1990s in the United States. And it's been a period in which, in many ways, the criminal justice system has been financialized. Uh, in many ways, a lot of institutions and practices that were paid for uh, in the past through public taxes, oftentimes progressive taxes, has been, have been turned into uh, procedures that, uh, in many ways, uh, attempt to extract resources from poor communities and disproportionately poor communities of color. So people who stay in prison uh, are charged for uh, getting all sorts of necessities from, from commissary. They're, they pay pay-to-stay fees for the prison. They're charged for their telephone calls. They're paid for video visits from their loved ones. Uh, they even pay have to pay to read through ebooks on tablets, and um, that happens alongside people paying for probation and parole, or uh, in courts paying various kinds of fees. And uh, fines have escalated. The amounts that people have to pay for bail, uh, financial conditions of bail, have gotten more common and uh, larger amounts. Uh, things like civil asset forfeiture, which emerged from the war on drugs and then expanded under the war on terror, allow uh, police and courts to take um, assets from people simply by under suspicion uh, that they have illicit sources. And so in all of these ways and, and more, um, policing and adjudication and punishment have in some ways been reorganized um, to be revenue generators for both governments and corporations in the United States. And they take billions of dollars out of poor communities and especially poor communities of color today. Your current book project with Joshua Page seeks to do more than just expose these practices, however. Can you tell us a little bit more about this project? Uh, what kinds of theoretical puzzles motivated this study? What kinds of key questions are you looking to address, and what do you ultimately hope to shed light on? Yeah, well, we tried, we're trying to do a number of different things uh, in the book. I mean, one of the, the most important things, I think, is to is simply to analyze how this work and how these practices work and what their consequences are on communities. So to really think through um, what are the civic consequences, the, the consequences for citizenship and democracy, what are the social and economic consequences for communities, um, how does this change power relations and relationships to the state um, in, in various ways. Um, but we're also asking a set of explanatory questions about how and why did this happen. Uh, you know, there's a long history of criminal justice institutions being involved in um, in dispossession and takings from uh, subjugated communities in the United States. But oftentimes, most of our history, it's been labor, like uh, convict leasing or slave patrols shoring up slave labor or something like that. Since the 1990s, we've seen this dramatic shift toward financial takings operations and various ways of charging people as consumers in the system. Why did that happen when it happened, in the form it happened? And how should we make sense of its relationship to this longer history um, of a country that thinks of itself in many ways as having uh, deep roots in liberalism, uh, that, that there's this long tradition of state and market actors working together 
um, in these predatory ways, as we call them, and, and how do we think about the present era in relation to that past? And on that note, you emphasize that financial takings in the criminal justice field need to be seen as one component of a broader structural and systemic account of the transformation of the American political economy um, as it underwent this process of neoliberalization. Uh, can we talk a little bit about what you mean by neoliberalism, uh, how criminal justice practices that you look at fit into this broader neoliberal turn in political economy, and then in what ways they might be related to uh, trends of capital accumulation that target poor communities, such as subprime mortgages and payday lending, alongside bail practices? Sure. Um, you know, the term neoliberalism is... Uh, contested term. Um, a lot of people have a very hostile reaction to the term in some ways. I suspect that that's sometimes because they feel targeted by it um, as liberals who are being criticized in some cases as, as neoliberal. Um, but, you know, some of the things that people complain about with neoliberalism just simply strike me as, as unfair. For example, um, neoliberalism is defined in many different ways. Um, but why is that a bad thing? Uh, if you look at most really core concepts that matter a great deal uh, for social and political analysis, they're defined in different ways. Democracy is a contested concept in very fruitful ways. Power is a very contested concept. The state is a very contested concept. And so, um, you know, I see that as potentially a strength rather than a weakness. It doesn't mean that people don't know what they're talking about. It means they have different visions of what this thing is, just like different visions of democracy. Um, the way we approach neoliberalism uh, in many ways um, is that neoliberalism involves, at one level, a kind of extension of market logics and rationalities to different um, different spheres of life, but in particular, in our case, in, we're interested in the marketization of the state um, and the changing of relationships between state and citizens such that citizens are understood as consumers and the state is oftentimes understood as a producer um, in various ways. Um, but and, and part of that is this notion of sort of the, the shifting away from the countervailing state, the state that, that in a sense countervails market power, and instead this emphasis on a kind of blurring of the boundaries between state and market so that uh, corporations are increasingly seen as partners of the state through public-private partnerships, but also corporations are increasingly seen as citizens um, and, and have the rights of citizens and are treated as such uh, and are seen as sort of uh, serving in a public-spirited way. Um, various ways. And, and so part of, uh, as that has happened, that sort of blurring of the boundaries between state and market, we've had, um, if we talk about the marketization we have to ask what kind of market it is. And this has happened at a time in which markets have financialized. Mm -hmm. um, and so financialization um, and privatization uh, and marketization are the main processes that we're sort of looking at in this project, along with a fourth, which is securitization. Mm -hmm. um, the sort of turn uh, away from the welfare state uh, and the kind of state protections against life uh, risks that the welfare state focuses on toward mm -hmm. Um, the kind of threats, internal and external, that call for uh, policing and military and carceral apparatuses. And one of the most distinct aspects of this project, on that note, is that you are advancing what you call a predation frame for thinking about the state or public power. Uh, I'm interested in hearing you say a little bit more about um, how this framework tells us about how the state operates, particularly in relationship to liberal and contractarian views of the state um, and its responsibilities. Yeah. So when most people think about criminal justice, financial takings of the sort that we're talking about, um, they think about it in terms of monetary sanctions or the criminalization of poverty, um, oftentimes uh, addressing it through a punishment frame, the idea that these are uh, ways in which poor people are punished for being poor or uh, they're simply a reflection of you know higher fines because uh, of this punitive culture that we have um, or the push to, to get tough on crime. And there's some truth to that, um, I think. But but our point in talking about this in terms of predation is to really connect it in many ways on one side to the longer history of dispossession in this country and the way in which um, the liberal state and um, the liberals, liberal uh, democracy and citizenship have always been underwritten through various forms of uh, expropriation, uh, and taking of lands and the taking of labor, 
um, and and how there's this intimate relationship, uh, and in many ways co-constitutive relationship between uh, the oppression of some and the uplifting of others and incorporation through various kinds of liberal and democratic equalities. Mm-hmm. So we want to make that um, connection there and, and show how this is a form of predation that is distinctive to our historical moment but follows in this long history. On the other hand, we also want to connect it to something you mentioned in the last question that I didn't get to, which is that this form of predation in the criminal justice field has emerged in a period of uh, a great sort of flowering of various predatory business models in many of the same communities Mm -hmm. uh, that are being targeted by criminal justice predation. Uh, The payday lenders, uh, you know, that uh, that, uh, sort of cultivate debt and payment uh, in various ways are very similar, have similar business Mm -hmm. models. The too-good-to-be-true credit card deals, uh, the student loans for for-profit universities that are really scams, the subprime uh, mortgage loans and subprime car loans and the furniture rental places and the on and on and on. When people go into court and find their legal financial obligations escalating as debts that they can't pay, and they're in jail and they find that they only have predatory options in the bail industry for getting out, that's not a foreign experience for most people um, who are in that position. They've experienced that in their communities. Um, watching debts pile up and only confronting predatory options is the nature of, of life today for many who are uh, down in the lower reaches of the social order in some ways. Yeah, and I'm wondering then if we can talk also about a related question, which is the way that the predation framework you're articulating allows us to see how class, race, and gender actually intersect to create these mutually reinforcing structures of domination and exploitation. Uh, Can you explain, for example, why bail institutions and practices are a particularly good site for illustrating the way that this this operates? Yeah, so um, as part of this project, my co-author, Josh Page, uh, conducted a year and a half of ethnographic research working at the front lines of the bail industry um, as a bail agent. And one of the things that we have written about, uh, a piece that we... Uh, published recently in the Russell Sage Foundation Journal, RSF, um, is is about the way in which uh, race and class and gender sort of work together to structure bail predation. So I think it's no surprise probably to many uh, that, that the people who are passing through uh, the criminal justice system and find themselves arrested and in jail and under charges and in need of bail services are disproportionately poor and people of color. Um, But what people have talked about less, I think, and what people are less aware of is how gender operates here. If anything, people think about gender in this context, that they assume it's mainly men uh, who are in jail, and it is disproportionately uh, younger men of color uh, from poor neighborhoods. But what, what people don't realize is that on the other side of that, that the financial burdens of, of much of this system that I've described, this sort of predatory takings, that financial burden is disproportionately borne by women, and particularly women of color. Um, 83% of the adults who pay uh, for uh, prison costs for, for a prisoner are women. Um, the vast majority of people who sign off on bail agreements and are on the hook for those payments are women. And the question is why? And and part of the advantage of the ethnographic research is that we're able to see um, how it is that, that bail agents on the ground um, make assumptions about who's likely to step up um, and take care of the, the bail agent, of the, of the person in jail, the defendant, um, by absorbing these costs. And in a sense, we argue, the social organization of care, responsibilities and roles along gender lines, becomes the kind of structure um, that organizes predation in the bail industry. So uh, if Josh you know, had someone uh, who was going to be a new client who was in, they found out about a case, someone sitting in jail, first thing a supervisor would say to him is, have you called the mom yet? Right? With the assumption that it's the mom, or in some cases the auntie or the grandmother, um, or sometimes a woman as a romantic partner, would, would be the one who would step up and absorb the cost, take on the risk, Um, and ultimately have their resources take them from from them. So one of the things that's crucial to understand about criminal justice predation today is that it's financially centered 
and that the extraction is not really coming from the people who are arrested necessarily um, or charged or convicted or in prison. They're being drained out of the networks of people around them, mm -hmm. right? Many of whom have, never, have not been charged with any wrongdoing at all. Mm -hmm. And looking at bail practices also strikes me as a really productive and fascinating way of studying how political power on the local level, such as in counties and municipalities and so forth, adjust and responds to broader dynamics of political economy of the United States. Um, speaking in terms of the kind of budget crunch, for example, that a lot of these local governments underwent uh, since the 1990s. So what would be the most important insights that we can gain by beginning with what is a nationwide problem of mass incarceration and then looking at the more granular, le granular level of local institutions and practices and then moving back out towards a broader framework? Yeah, um, that's a big question, but I think that it's, it's important to think about it in that way, that, um, that what we're really dealing with here in the rise of financial predation in the criminal justice field um, is, a set of, is the sort of convergence of a set of developments um, that are much broader in the political economy and the way in which they sort of uh, Im impress themselves as pressures um, at the local level and, and how actors cope. Uh, under severe constraints, very strong pressures um, to try to deal with with the problem. So in in the United States from the 1970s on, we had this tremendous process of devolution of responsibilities at the same time that revenues uh, were constrained for for local actors. Um, and so there were greater financial obligations at the local level level combined with um, less ability to meet them. And the resulting austerity in many ways um, led to surface cutbacks that were, that were really severe for many kinds of social services that people rely on and for schools and for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, but in the case of criminal justice, it was very hard to, to, to do that because people were pushing for a tougher and tougher um, approach to crime and, and not just Republicans pushing for it as a, as a racial wedge issue uh, to peel off disaffected white Democrats, but also Democrats wanting to prove that they weren't soft on crime. And so it was very little ability to stop this political juggernaut. Um, but that very juggernaut in some ways provided a basis for meeting these needs at the local levels that in, at in the name of getting tough on criminals, you could raise mm -hmm. fines, and in the name of protecting public safety, you can impose higher bail amounts, and uh, in the name of uh, building new prisons, you could turn to private actors in various ways who came into the field, and, and all these things. So, so at the local level, you really see this coming together of forces that we oftentimes talk about in, in quite abstract and disembodied ways, um, privatization, marketization of the mm -hmm. state, um, the sort of securitization woven through that financialization of all these processes. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you talk about something like marketization of the state and monetization and things like that, I mean, when you look at the local level, you get these things like um, there were local jails that were turning the bare walls of their cells into uh, something that could generate revenue by selling advertising space so that when you were put in the jail, you were locked up with a placard that had the number for one defense attorney and one bail mm -hmm. bond service, mm -hmm. right? And that's all you had in there. And so, I mean, literally looking for everything that they could find that they could convert because they were absolutely starved for revenues, right? And so in many ways, um, it's important to recognize the local level as being its own level of scale and um, how it's positioned differently than other levels of scale and in relation to them. But it's also important to understand it as a kind of microcosm, a place where you can see these big forces that we theorize about and we think about and we talk about changing the political economy. It's where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. um, and you can really see practices being put in place in their name. Mm -hmm. And speaking of this dynamic between the local and the national, you know, the problem of mass incarceration has now increasingly moved to the forefront of, I think, national politics and conversation. So I'm curious to hear, um, while you were conducting this research, what were the most significant instances or the most memorable ones of political mobilization or movements or maybe litigation or even just public commentary that you've noticed has evolved surrounding this issue? And looking forward, what kinds of mobilization or social movements uh, 
would it actually take to challenge and abolish these kinds of practices? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that um, is exciting about this area is that increasingly it's an area where there's a lot of political movement um, and where there have been some real victories recently. Um, so I think that we're a long way from, from really confronting this. We're a long way from, uh, from reversing these injustices in any way. And of course, as I've been trying to emphasize, there are injustices that are rooted in broader changes in the political economy. So we're not likely to completely undo, undo these things without much more radical changes in some ways. But that said, um, I think it's really important to, to see that uh, movements like uh, Black Lives Matter um, and uh, prison protest efforts like the prison labor strike in the pa- strikes in the past few years um, have really put these issues on their agenda. And I think that, so they're part of the disruptive protest um, kind of movements going on. And I think that there's a great deal of success that's been happening through litigation campaigns, uh, Supreme Court uh, decision in Tims v. Indiana uh, that sort of that, that put a real... Uh, that, that really struck a blow against civil asset forfeiture. Uh, there have been some bail reform efforts that have had some success, some efforts to curb, uh, you know, charges to parents for juvenile detention. Uh, just this past week, California became the first state in the country to ban uh, private detention centers and prisons going forward, et cetera. Um, that said, you know, I think that um, that one of the difficulties here is that uh there, it is such a decentralized and fragmented system um, that you really, you know, a lot of these successes that I just named there in a particular locality, that doesn't change the majority of the country. Even a particular state doesn't change the majority of the country. And criminal justice isn't really controlled at the federal level. The interesting thing about the federal level is um, that at the end of the Obama administration, Loretta Lynch, attorney general, um, really spoke out forcefully against privatization and private prisons. Um, and that was really effective. And in fact, you notice that the, the pri- big private prison companies like Geo Group and Core Civic, which used to be Corrections Corporation of America, um, their stocks began to go down. And, um, and when Donald Trump was elected, they soared afterwards um, because of people's expectations. But the interesting thing about that moment with Loretta Lynch and the Obama administration was that it really captured a sort of liberal focus on the private actors and the idea that the government is the good alternative and that the go- if government is failing in any way, it's because it's not doing enough uh, good things like regulating or, or doing these things rather. Than- but you know, most prisons are not privately run. Um, and when Loretta Lynch came out and said, we're going to get rid of the contra- federal contracts with private prisons, most so-called public prisons are thoroughly privatized. Uh, the, the food is served by a private company. The commissary is run by a private company. Security, maybe. <laughs> I mean, it's everything. There's all, the, all of these, the, the video visitation and the telephone calls, and the, you name it. And so you're not really getting the private out. That's one problem. But the other problem is that it ignores the fact that much of what we're talking about in this book project is government um, funding, you know, pulling in revenues by extracting uh, financial resources from these communities through the criminal justice system. It's not just the private sector. Mm -hmm. Um, In some ways, liberals like to talk about private prison corporations or commercial bail because it fits into their narrative about bad market actors um, and good government trying to fight them. And in many ways, libertarian conservatives like to talk about civil asset forfeiture. There's probably a good new article on civil asset forfeiture every other month in Reason Magazine. Um, And it's great uh, stuff because they want to talk about the narrative of big government taking stuff from you. Um, It fits into their narrative. And what's hard to sort of... Um, get people to talk about in in the United States right now politically is that this is a predatory public-private partnership. This is really about uh, a politics on the dimension of of dominant groups and subordinate groups in many ways, and it's working through both state and market in- institutions. Professor Sauce, uh, thank you again for joining us today and for sharing uh, some of your ongoing work. It's been a wonderful conversation. This has been the podcast of the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy. Thank you for listening.